Okay, so let me just introduce myself then. My name is Peter Rich. I'm an assistant professor in policy analysis and management uh, here at Cornell. And I'm a sociologist by training. And uh, among the various courses I teach here, I teach a spatial demography course. And I'm trained in spatial methods. And um, uh, a relationship that developed with, uh, with Christian Sprague, um, one of the PhD students who took the class, sort of hinged around some, some core ideas around how, how space governs access to opportunity. And so we started talking about a year and a half ago and built this um, project that we're going to be presenting today. Um, so I want to start really by thanking Christian because, um, you know, he's not in my department uh, and he brings with him a lot of skills and insight from an engineering perspective. And that has been tremendously helpful for my, for this project. Um, we've computed things at a scale in the billions that, um, that I would never have been able to do without him. So, um, so Christian's uh, also going to be kind of fielding some questions as they come up in the chat um, as we go. And we'll just kind of um, take it from there. So the, the talk I'm going to give today is about school district boundaries and unequal access to educational opportunity. Um, so there, I'm going to make an argument that there are large gaps by race and income in access to high quality public schooling. Uh, so there's two questions that sort of um, I'm going to build on after establishing that empirical fact. The first is how much of that can be explained by zoning regulation and residential segregation. And then the second is what, actually the, the first in our minds, but the second in the, in the order of the talk is, is it possible to systematically measure access to public schools the way it might often be talked about? So I'm gonna start by just motivating this a little bit as a systemic problem. And I'm doing this with the hope that I catch those of you who are systems engineers um, and and think about a lot of a lot of different problems systemically that I want to sort of make the case that this is a, a good example for for that sort of systemic thinking. And as a sociologist, I'm often trained to think about how individuals are responding to constraints to sort of mutually construct this uh, social world that we live in. And um, my own work is really concerned with segregation and, um, and mechanisms that reproduce inequality uh, across generations. So here's what makes this a systemic problem is um, there are high prices to live in areas where the schools are better. Um, and there's a sort of long running um, evidence of residential segregation by race and income. This is historically constructed by policies um, during the first half of the 20th century. Um, and so what we have now is a sort of continuation of racial segregation. It, it's gone down slightly since 1968, but it's still um, relatively strong, especially between um, black and white households. And income segregation is actually on the rise. And so to the extent that those two things interact with um, the price of moving to an area where the schools are good, um, that could really uh, create some compound disadvantages that children inherit. So this is the real problem here is that um, children through no fault of their own, um, but rather through the circumstance of their parents' resources and the sort of community history that they grow up in uh, may have access to much more advantage or much more disadvantage um, and that that could really have long-term effects over their lifetime as well. So this is, I'm, I'm not going to oversell this. Um, I think a lot of people are really concerned about this in, in the general public. Um, and we can think about some key policy choices that tend to come up here. Um, one is to allocate marginalized children to high quality schools. So we might do this by sort of gerrymandering zones in a way so that kids in poor neighborhoods, for instance, can go to a, a high achieving school. Uh, alternatively, there are desegregation plans that first were done by race and now are a little bit starting to emerge by, by um, student income level or by the neighborhood where they live, but to try to um, shuffle students around. Uh, sometimes they have to ride a bus for a while, but, but if that gets them to a better school, then, then that's uh, 
then that can be productive. Um, alternatively, we can just leave students where they are um, and just try to redistribute resources. So invest um, invest dollars. And there's a there's a big public finance reform movement um, in the school system. And many schools now, many states now have um, this sort of uh, where they take property taxes and then redistribute across the state. Um, and then the third, the third policy choice is uh, to subsidize neighborhood integration. Uh, so in the sociology world, many people are very uh, interested in this moving to opportunity experiment that was that was run uh, by HUD um, in the early 2000s, where families were given vouchers to move to higher opportunity neighborhoods. And um, that has shown some promising results for the families that stayed in high opportunity neighborhoods uh, for the long term, that that's had a lot of positive effects on, on kids. Okay, so it's a systemic problem though because people are sorting according to this uh, according to this opportunity structure, and um, it can reinforce inequalities um, uh, over time. So today I'm going to give some information about our complex public school system. I'll, I'll try to be as brief as possible, um, and then I will um, dive into a descriptive analysis. And um, we may have time, um, hopefully we have some time to talk about the measurement complexities uh, that are underlying this project, um, which has been occupying a lot of mine and Christian's time over the past six months or so. Um, and uh, in addition to COVID and everything else occupying everyone's attention, this has become our focus. So. Um, so without further ado, let me start by giving you um, an overview. And I'm going to use the Bay Area as an example. So this is the Bay Area in California. And you can see here that we have, um, uh, this is San Francisco. Over here is Oakland. Um, Richmond is up here. Um, I'm going to present on the Bay Area simply because I lived there for 10 years and I know, know it really well. Um, and I worked in the education sector there. Um, that said, um, we're, we'll be showing some national statistics as well. Okay, so first let's think about school districts. So districts are these larger boundaries that um, administer public schooling. So that's a first kind of zone um, where a student lives within a district and that sets the um, number of schools that they may be able to access and other sorts of curriculum and teaching policies. Um, a little more complexity comes from uh, catchment zones. So catchment zones are smaller areas within a district that um, exp that sort of define if a student lives in that area, we know specifically what school they'll be going to. To add to the complexity, there are different types of schools. So um, the light circles that are sort of populating this map are traditional public schools, the ones we might normally think of. Think of. But then um, charter schools tend to have open enrollment policies for kids within the district and magnet schools do as well. And so what we get is some districts uh, like Oakland Unified over here has started to um, bring a lot of, uh, of charter schools into its policy as a way to try to meet student needs across neighborhoods. Okay, so uh, this, of course, gets a little more complicated when we think about the achievement level of different schools. So um, I have in here a color scale that you'll see later um, applied to neighborhoods more broadly, but um, here we have deciles of achievement level for different schools. And so what you can see is that there's spatial clustering for the low performing schools. This is on a standardized metric of, of um, test score achievement. So you have some areas where there's clustering of uh, low performance, some areas out in the suburbs where you have clustering of high performance. And to some extent, it also clusters by the larger school district. So I'm just gonna zoom in, let me go back one slide. Um, this area right here, um, uh, Christian, can you give me a thumbs up if you can see my cursor when the, where it's hovering? Nope. Oh, okay. Some people may be able to see it. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so um, there's an area here that I'm gonna zoom in on. Um, uh, 
where we have what I would call a donut hole district. So this is um, Oakland Unified is right here. This is Berkeley, Berkeley Unified School District. Here's Emeryville. This is where you might find um, a lot of uh, people who work at Pixar. Um, but in Oakland, there's a lot of poverty and sort of um, long-term segregation. Uh, and then there's this one community here um, called Piedmont. And Piedmont is an independent city and they have their own school district and they have um, very high housing prices. Um, and you can see here that the schools in within Piedmont are high performing. There are schools outside of Piedmont in Oakland. These are up in the sort of hills um, where there's also a lot of wealth and there's also high performing schools. Um, but I kind of want to draw your attention to this boundary area right here, where a student living just near the boundary may actually live closer to this high performing Piedmont school. But because of zoning regulation, they're unable to attend that school. And instead, they're going to need to go to one of these, uh, to this lower performing school. So this kind of motivates the, the, the idea of thinking about zones um, in a little more detail. So just to summarize the complexity here, we've got uh, a residentially zoned system where there are school districts and then catchment zones within those. And then there are uh, non-neighborhood options that spring up magnets and charters. And there's a whole other layer of complexity, which is that the extent to which um, kids are allowed to transfer between um, boundaries within their district, these zones, and between um, neighboring school district boundaries. So this uh, array shows us state policies um, where um, a, sort of across, a, across columns, we're looking at um, areas that allow some kind of flexibility in moving across school district boundaries. So um, Arizona, Colorado, Delaware, Florida, South Dakota, and Utah have very flexible enrollment policy around moving between districts. Um, California is in this sort of um, uh, middle area where they do allow transfers between districts or between catchment zones, but uh, they, have, uh, they have stipulations about how that happens and a receiving school has to have the capacity for it. And it's often limited to students who are attending um, schools that are performing below a certain threshold. And so it's not quite open choice. It's more like um, uh, a, a sort of regulated, limited version of that open choice. Um, and, and then there are areas where um, school choice across boundaries is really um, not supported at all. OK, so we have a very complex national system. There's heterogeneity by state. Um, and even sort of how catchment zones are drawn, all of this uh, makes for a very fun puzzle because something that you'll often hear if you ever are seeking to buy a home, you hear the, the mantra, location, 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 and the question of how good are the schools? And um, even just as understanding what school someone would be assigned to is a very locally specific type of knowledge. Um, so the zones produce some inefficiencies that I want to walk us through just a little bit here. Um, so what we've done um, from, the, from the outset is actually measured the distance to all schools from every block effectively. Um, so, and we've measured this using um, road network data. So here's my, my, one of my advantages to working with, with Christian on this is um, he thinks a lot about transportation and, and land use. Um, and furthermore, he ha has some really good computational skills that I uh, was unable to, to leverage on my own where he had to, uh, computed billions and billions of, um, of commute distances using um, open source route mapping software. So we've built this huge database where we not only have distance, but we also have the commute times. Um, we haven't incorporated those yet. But we're looking at um, sort of how many kids, uh, just as an early descriptive, how many kids um, are unable to attend their closest school just because of a district boundary line. It turns out that that's about 1.5 million kids age five to nine. We're going to be looking just at elementary schools here. And that that on average creates an excess commute of a, a little over three kilometers 
per trip. So annually per student, um, 180 school days, two trips each way. Uh, this is sort of a lowball estimate. Um, we're, we're seeing about 1,200 kilometers extra travel per year for, for these kids. Um, the commute burden is largest in the south, and it's bigger in rural areas. OK, I'm seeing a couple of chats come up, just wanting to make sure. Um, I have not managed my chats very well. Um, Christian, we're good. You're handling? OK. OK, so, uh, you know, so that's a large chunk of students, but that doesn't necessarily mean they would go to the closest school. We're not, we're not imposing that assumption at all. But just from the outset, that sort of gets at a problem of a modifiable aerial unit problem that we talk about in spatial demography. It's really an issue of scale and how zones sort of cluster and aggregate accessibility in ways that can be inefficient at the margins of those boundaries. Um, and a sizable number of kids would actually be able to go to a top quintile school if not for those school district boundaries. So uh, where I want to go with this, though, is to talk about that this is not just an inefficiency problem, although that is certainly important. And from a transportation and infra infrastructure standpoint, we really care about that. Um, the sociological side of my, my interest here is really on thinking about how this um, impacts uh, gaps in inequality by race and by income. And so um, this, these means right here, these are average achievement of accessible schools, which I'm going to explain in a little bit more detail how we arrive at these means. Um, uh, but this gives you a sense overall of what we're looking at, where um, black children, based on where they live in blocks throughout, throughout the US, the average schools that they're, that they're accessing um, are much lower in terms of standard units than white students. So we're estimating a gap of negative 0.41. Sometimes it's hard to, to read just in, in standard deviation units. Um, so some people do a sort of back of the envelope suggest, suggestion that this would be uh, roughly like uh, 1.7 grade years behind. Um, in terms of the sort of peer achievement level. Uh, so that's very sizable. Um, and just to put another sort of contextual way to, to think about this is that most school interventions, like moving to small class sizes, um, tend to move the needle by about a tenth of a standard deviation. Uh, so about 25% of, of this gap. Uh, so, so this gives us a sort of like a, a baseline to think through through how this is happening, but these are means, and means um, can distort what's what's happening. So um, first, I want to show you a map to kind of uh, express why we think this is happening, and then I'm going to show you some distributions. So this is a map in the Bay Area of um, median income. These are in decile bins, and you can see where in the lighter colors you have uh, much more much higher income neighborhoods. Um, including this Piedmont area is a very high income. That's the top, top decile. Um, and then you have areas where there's concentrations of low income. Uh, and so income segregation is going to track on to this story, as is uh, racial segregation. So this is the percent children who are white, um, where the lighter areas have more white kids and um, the sort of uh, pastel bluish colors are um, sort of middle of the road, what, what you might expect in the Bay Area more generally. So you have whiter suburbs and less white in the central city areas. OK, I know I'm throwing a lot of maps and data. Um, Christian and I talked about it, and it was like, this is what we want to do, present a lot of data. So, um, so we're going to put this all together. If you think about all of those layers of zoning, accessibility, and then the commute distances to schools, and um, and do this at a national level and um, generate a distribution of accessibility to school quality. Um, so here we have a red line for this distribution for black children based on where they live. And um, here's the distribution for white children based on where they live. This is for the entire country uh, based on block level data. And um, this is the, the mean gap is the, you know, the difference between these two means, but you can just see how much, uh, 
how these tails look and how the distribution sort of um, uh, expresses itself. And that's going to become important as we start to add some, some intuition about zones. OK, so you may be interested going beyond just black and white. Um, here's the distribution. We have white and, and red. Um, I'm sorry, <laughs> black is the red line, um, white is the blue line, and then we also add um, Hispanic and um, Asian population distributions in here. And one thing that's a little uh, distinct about the Asian population is that there's much more dispersion. Um, this is, a, a, you know, the central tendency is has lower density and it's much wider at the tails. And that expresses the sort of range of inequality with among the Asian American population and the types of neighborhoods they live in, uh, which is sometimes obscured when we're looking just at mean differences. And you see, um, for instance, uh, a mean advantage over whites over white kids in um, in school quality access. But uh, but of course, if we were to only use means, we would miss a, a huge part of this tail, um, who maybe students from the Southeast Asia or uh, recent immigrants who, who live in uh, neighborhoods with, with different access to school quality. Okay, so that's the, the race sort of story in a nutshell. I still am um, leaving it mysterious to explain exactly how we generate these, uh, these plots. Um, we're gonna get to that really shortly. Um, I wanted to show you uh, the similar story for poor and non-poor students. Um, based on whether their family's income is below the, the federally defined poverty threshold. Um, we get a similar story, the gap's not quite as large. There's more of an overlapping middle of the distribution here. Okay, so, um, so the key question that we wanna ask um, empirically, and, and we're gonna present some descriptive findings on, is how much this access inequality that we see, how much of that is explained by zoning regulation and residential segregation. So what I just presented reflects the actual residential distribution by race and by poverty status. Um, and it also reflects the complex zoning uh, dynamics that go on in terms of catchment zones, school district boundaries, uh, charter and magnet choice options, uh, and distance constraints as well, in terms of how far people are, are able to go, um, all of that is sort of built in to express the average uh, neighborhood uh, school quality that, that kids can access from their block. So uh, to define access a little bit more clearly, um, let me just walk you through, uh, through how we're thinking about this. So for each census block, we're kind of thinking of a moving window where we consider all schools within 25 kilometers from its centroid. Um, and we measure driving distance using road net network data uh, for all potential school matches within that area. We chose 25 kilometers because that's the uh, 95th percentile of um, sort of how far kids will actually go to school that we've observed in, in um, student level data. Actually, I think it's the 99th percentile. Um, and you only get kids going to schools further than 25 kilometers out if, they, um, if they're in very rural areas like in Alaska and, and a, a, few other, um, a few other parts of the country. Um, so we measure driving distance and we're gonna really use that to think about um, commute as a constraint on access to schools. Um, and then we also identify catchment zone and district zone. We bring all of this in and um, we link this to uh, school attributes, uh, the achievement level of the school and also the size of the school. Um, so all of that together gives us an idea of how to do this. But the question is like, how do you build, how do you operationalize all of that information in a in, uh, empirically consistent way that accounts for us all sorts of problems like different densities of school options, different population densities, competition potentially between students uh, to attend attractive schools. Um, all of these sorts of factors we need to think about. Um, and so the way we do this is we take a weighted mean of all the schools that, that are accessible. And the weight that we use is the likelihood that a student from a particular block would attend that school. 
So how do you measure likelihood of attending? So uh, what we've done is actually accessed um, a system-wide um, student administrative data set where we see over a 20-year span where kids live every year and where they attend school. And so to construct the weight, we bring all these variables in to a conditional logit model where we effectively predict the likelihood that they attend school J out of all of the potential schools that they that they could um, enroll in. Um, and we we estimate that um, using various infrastructure um, parameters, the sort of similar to what I described in terms of zone and distance. And then we also add in um, attract sort of attractive features of the school that might induce competition. Um, so then we take the parameters from that model that are just about infrastructure uh, and we graft them on to national publicly available data as a way to basically express this same probability um, uh, under the assumption that the school system we're using, it's a state, I haven't gotten permission yet to share the parameters or tell you what state it is. It's not California. Um, but. Uh, uh, but we, we basically assume that the way um, families are sending kids to schools is relatively similar. Um, so, we, so that's the sort of basic idea, except we're not going to do it just from the perspective of the student choosing a school. We're also going to consider the perspective of a school choosing students. And so we develop a similar model from the school perspective. and. Um, we then generate a weight for every block school pair um, that's based on the probability a school um, would sort of pick a student from that block under certain constraints. And, and that's multiplied by the probability that a student would attend that school. That joint probability um, is then summed up over all of the options to a block. Um, and, and so we take any one joint probability and divide by the sum of all of them to get a weight for uh, uh, for that particular school. So we're taking a weighted mean there. We considered a whole lot of other options, um, including, you know, a, a very simple uh, like inverse distance function, uh, a Gaussian weighting function that uses distance. But we like this approach because it actually incorporates student information um, and student behavior. And uh, we're able to control a way um, some things that might be affecting our, our parameters, like um, attraction to um, uh, certain school quality characteristics. And, um, and then the last, thing, um, th the last thing that I'll say about this is uh, Christian has, has helped me uh, really attend to the problem of hyperparameters and that we wanna be careful how much we uh, insert, how many assumptions we insert into any kind of a, a model. And so um, most other weighting structures require um, some sort of arbitrary thresholds or, or um, exponents on distance that, that we didn't want to put here. Okay, so we've got a bunch of data. I want to get back to the results. So I'll just tell you we're bringing in all of these different data sources and bringing in um, the geographic component. And we use this to estimate neighborhood access to school quality at the block level for the entire country. Um, and so this map now, instead of having schools on here, these are neighborhood polygons uh, at the block level. And every block is sort of scored based on the average school quality um, that, it's access that it has accessible to it. So you'll see large sort of um, uh, uh, negative or, or I'm sorry, lower access to, to high quality schools in the South, which is really consistent with the education literature. Um, in Massachusetts and in parts of the Northeast, you see uh, much higher access and also in the Midwest. Um, the Bay Area over here is a sort of pocket of high, relatively high access, um, but rural areas in, in California tend to have lower, lower performing schools. Okay, so we're gonna zoom in a little bit. Um, back to the Bay Area. And you can see here how these neighborhoods, um, how these neighborhoods kind of track on. Um, so the district boundaries are still in play in California. There is a friction component. So, so 
we've estimated um, from a state that it sort of allows some limited access across boundaries. So we can use that information to um, sort of uh, account for the possibility that school, that there, these boundaries might be semi-permeable, but that there's some friction costs associated with them that we're gonna pick up on. Um, you can see in San Francisco over, um, over here, the sort of thumb uh, in the Bay Area, um, the thumbnail, you can see that we're picking up some distance factors within San Francisco. So San Francisco doesn't have catchment zones I don't think so. We don't have catchment zone data. So, uh, and I'm pretty sure it doesn't actually have catchment assignment zones. So you see a sort of smooth function that's happening within, um, within San Francisco, where in Hunter's Point um, and parts closer to downtown, there are lower performing schools. And then out as you get toward the ocean, you get into higher, higher performing schools. Okay, so that's our, this is our crowning achievement is being able to map this nationally. Um, but then we can start to ask, well, what would happen if we turned zones off completely? Um, and the reason we can do that is because we've measured accessibility for all schools, uh, uh, sort of either whether we account for these boundaries or not. And so by re-predicting our, um, our score under different scenarios, we can sort of get a sense of how much um, what this might look like if the zones were not playing a role. So I'm gonna uh, toggle back and forth just so you can see we have a sort of sharp relief here. And in some cases, um, uh, accessibility is really snapping to a district boundary. And then when you um, turn off those, it smooths, uh, it sort of smooths the distance function and allows a little bit more accessibility. So I'm gonna zoom in on that area of Piedmont to give you a, a better sense of how this works. So on the left side, we have our current policy context and you have some um, neighborhoods here that are accessing lower performing schools, but this district boundary is uh, sort of doing its job, so, so to speak, to ensure that kids in this area are, are accessing these high quality schools. They're paying higher, they, they pay excess property taxes, um, through local bond issues to help fund those schools extra. Um, but the kids right here are just sort of, they may have lower uh, property values, lower taxes, but from a kid's perspective, they're just um, blocked, blocked from being able to access some of the nice schools here. But if we um, smooth this a little bit, where distance is still a factor, but, um, and, and capacity is even still a factor, but we see how uh, the blurred lines produces a scenario in which um, kids in these neighborhoods now have access to some of these higher quality schools and that's uh, bumping up their average. So this smoothing function is, um, is sort of what we would see in a, under, under some of the assumptions of our model, but what we would see in a scenario where um, zones are not only um, allowed to be crossed, but they're, they're not observed at all between districts or catchment areas. Um, so, so I don't want to just cherry pick a particular area um, of the country, and especially Piedmont. Um, I mentioned I did education work out there. Um, I worked in the Oakland schools in, in East Oakland down here, and um, I tutored kids in, in Piedmont, and um, they helped subsidize uh, my, my early 20s. And so I'm, I'm not mad at the kids in Piedmont. I'm not mad at the families. But um, I think it's important for us to quantify the what we sort of gain and lose in um, in sort of enforcing boundaries. Okay, so you've seen this distribution plot before, and now I'm just going to show you again. This is the sort of racial inequality in the sort of existing policy context, and now we're going to look at how this might look if we were to drop the zone policy. And, um, and just have location. So if we drop zone policy, but we still fix where people live, you see how the distribution shifts um, for black students um, just a little bit over to the right, where it's the left tail for students. Um, these students are dramatically benefiting. Well, sorry, I'm talking about a distribution, not particular students. But what we're seeing is um, that this shift over is allowing students greater access to higher performing schools just by turning off boundary enforcement. 
Um, for white students, the distribution shifts in the opposite direction. So what we're, we're getting is this sort of shift a little bit towards the center. Is it a huge shift? No, because it's only really going to be the kids at the boundaries who are going to be the most affected by this. Um, and we're also estimating a fairly conservative model that assumes kids would not go very far. Um, if we allow for a longer distance to get to school, um, then, then the effect is a little bit more dramatic. But um, so the, the gap goes down um, from point, negative 0 0.41 to negative 0 0.381. 3, so we're seeing a little bit of a, of a change there. Um, so, so to kind of take stock from here, um, I want to be really careful. The, the way that this analysis is set up, it, you may see this and say, oh, is, is this an argument then that we should turn off the zones? And um, I want to be careful about overstating that um, because what, what we're doing is fixing residential location. And if you, uh, you can't fix people's residential location because people make choices and respond accordingly. And you may argue that actually they've already responded to their choice sets by making residential choices to move to Piedmont or move uh, to other areas. And so, uh, so what we're doing is kind of observing something in static equilibrium and asking how much work are the zones doing above what the sort of residential distribution already um, uh, already would do. So uh, so a way to describe this in economic terms is that we're, um, we're sort of looking at this in static equilibrium, but there are real general equilibrium challenges. So like I mentioned, residential sorting um, could occur in, in response to it. Um, and also if you change w which students um, go to which schools, that could, fundamentally change the composition of the schools, which may then also change the, um, the, the quality itself, the achievement level of the schools themselves. Uh, and so this is, a th this is a really complicated question to ask what would happen if we actually changed the policy. And I'm not able to answer that at all right now. Um, we're thinking through some dynamic sorting models that might help us think through this a little bit better, um, at least get some bounds on, on what might happen. But um, that doesn't mean that this is uh, devoid of policy implications. There are smaller scale lottery type approaches like Boston Metco has a program that um, uh, gives a small proportion of kids from the Boston public schools access to um, outer suburban um, high quality schools. And uh, there's been a lot of mixed evidence on, on how effective that has been about student outcomes and that sort of thing. But, one of the key things I want to settle on here is that it has not induced some widespread residential gaming of people moving right near a boundary or people moving away if their school gets Metco students in. Um, so, you know, conceptually, we may also think about other policy options. And so this earlier slide that I had shown you, I was thinking about what we could allocate children to different schools. We could also subsidize neighborhood integration. And um, this is more of a, a playful idea than, than thinking that this has a lot of policy uh, traction right now. But I wanna give you a sense um, of how residential segregation within school districts uh, might help explain this. So the, the solid lines are the, still the two distributions that I presented earlier that are sort of like the true reality. And now um, what I've done is um, artificially reassigned students so that they, they are redistributed within their school district so that every block has the same racial um, proportions as the district overall. And in that reassignment, I ask, okay, now, now what do we see? And you do see a, a bigger adjustment on the gap. It was at 0 0.381 and now it's down to 0.297. So that tells us that segregation um, within school districts is certainly playing some sort of a role here. Um, but segregation between districts is um, playing a much larger role. So uh, the mean black-white gap in the sort of um, uh, current policy context is 0.41. If we were to reassign just kids in metropolitan areas um, to block so that they're evenly distributed um, based on the overall metro area racial uh, 
composition distribution. Um, if we do that, we get a um, the the sort of black uh, distribution curve here moves dramatically to the right, and the white distribution curve does move a little bit. It does move to the left. Um, it, they're not perfectly overlapping because there's still a rural story that's not accounted for here, and there's also differences between metro areas that are that are still sort of allowed to express, but. Um, you know, I'm not suggesting that it's viable for us to um, uh, reshuffle people everywhere, but this instead sort of tells us uh, a little bit about how much of this story seems to be driven by uh, residential segregation between districts. Okay, so this project uh, is going to go some places. Um, we're looking at neighborhood predictors for it, um, building some dynamic sorting models uh, using student level data to think about how choices might change, um, uh, how outcomes might change for students. We're bringing in housing price data at the housing unit level to think about uh, in hedonic analyses, how much are people paying for the sort of marginal benefits they're getting from the boundaries. And um, looking also at residential selection models from family panel data. And then using this to predict some bigger question onto bigger questions like how much uh, does this add to our understanding of intergenerational uh, economic mobility and inequality. I'm sure I've mentioned a lot of jargon words that I've forgotten that they're jargon, so I apologize in advance for that. Um, so let me just summarize and conveniently um, or not so maybe we can get to it in the Q and A. Um, uh, I haven't gone in depth on the methods the way I wanted to. But just to summarize the descriptive results, um, zoning boundaries sort of stack on to residential school access inequality. Um, it's about 7.6% greater with zones than if we were to just sort of accept the existing residential uh, distribution for black white access. And then similarly uh, for poor non poor access. So there is potentially a positive effect of open enrollment policy, but that's probably going to be inhibited. These are not massive changes, and that's going to be inhibited by the commute costs of where families could actually move, and then over time by responsive sorting. So um, this uh, array that I showed you um, does express variability, and a sort of um, certain states are very pro open enrollment. And um, I certainly wouldn't stand in their way of that, especially um, open enrollment across district lines. But uh, it's not likely to make a huge dent relative to the distribution of residential segregation that we have in the US. OK, so, so that's the sort of summary. Um, and the next sort of set of slides that I um, would like to show you, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wrap it up for a Q&A sort of give us some equations and walk you through the intuition of the model a little bit more. So, um, and sort of talk about why, where the innovation is happening. So I'm skipping past those, um, getting to my thank you slide. And, um, uh, you know, actually for our discussion, I'm going to put up this map um, to maybe spur a little bit of the discussion here and, and see what you all um, have to say. So uh, I haven't, I'm not sure if somebody will, how we should moderate this. I, I'll pull up the participants. And if you have a question, maybe you can just raise your hand and I'll look in the queue and we can start talking from there. So thanks for your attention. Zoom calls are tough. I know a little bit. Um, hopefully this had enough exciting data for you to, to pull you along. OK, I'm seeing the first question from Philip. Hi, I actually had two kind of small questions, um, if I may ask them. Um, the first one was, um, if you think kind of a move to um, like online learning or, or something like that um, is going to help um, stop this to some degree because there's so many resources out there now that um, enable people um, of any kind of economic status to access really valuable information. Um, yeah, so I'll say this would, this would be a way of totally flex, you know, making the system totally flexible and you could um, attend essentially the, the best school in the country, you know, according to your preferences. That's a really good question. Um, I'm, a, I'm skeptical about how that, how we will transition to that. I think uh, there's been a lot of pushback 
um, among teachers. Um, there's been a lot of pushback among families against online learning. And so that may be the kind of thing that is uh, most likely to get uptake from higher resource families that can sort of facilitate learning at home, uh, maybe don't have dual, dual income earners. Um, and, uh, and so the extent to which that would close these gaps is, is harder to estimate because I, I think public schools are, are still going to be around. But that's a really good question. I've been thinking about that too under these conditions. You had a Thank second you. question too. Think, yes, yes, that, this one's uh, pretty short, but I was uh, getting rid of the boundary lines. I was just curious if you think that would have an effect on the housing prices that were, let's say, just, just a block away um, from the boundary line previously, but now that there's no boundary line, maybe those kind of houses would um, increase in their value or, or not. I don't know. What do you think about it? Yeah, so this is where we want to go with the, um, uh, the housing price data is... Uh, I've seen some really cool studies of specific areas like um, in Denver, for instance, where a zoning change, um, it led to smoothing of, ho of house prices on both sides of the boundary. So the, the sort of blocks on the sort of privileged side of the boundary, once that boundary gets lifted, the premium they were paying to live in there um, doesn't really hold in the market in quite the same way. And vice versa, on the other side, now new access sort of would would allow that to happen. So your intuition there is is definitely right. And you know, there's one thing I want to add to this. Um, as someone who studies uh, racial inequality and racial wealth gaps, that um, that this actually could affect how homeowners, black homeowners, the sort of depreciation or or lack of appreciation in, in house prices. Uh, accrues over time, if they're systematically in areas under historical reasons and discrimination reasons, um, if they're systematically in areas that have lower performing schools that track less well onto the market, um, this would be a, a way that that sort of um, builds on to that black, black white wealth gap. Thanks for your questions. Um, I, I see Shane up next. Yeah, thanks very much. Um, yeah, super interesting and um, terrific work on quantifying some of these things. Um, I was curious, the school tax system is, is, a, is sort of somehow closely related to a lot of these issues. If you could wave a magic wand and have schools essentially centrally funded from the federal government down, to what extent would you be helping or hindering? Yes. Okay. Thank you. So there is um, there's there are a couple um, really important questions that are sort of embedded under that. And so um, so what I'll say first is that in states where there has been school finance reform that takes that funding, centralizes it at the state level, and then redistributes, um, there have been positive gains on a number of outcomes for um, poor and racial minority students. Um, there's a couple great uh, uh, economics papers that came out in the last few years that have really articulated that, which upends some of the conventional wisdom, at least in the education world, which is that it's not clear how much resources track on to, to outcomes. Um, so, so you could see a federally subsidized system doing, doing something similar where um, it just equalizes across the board to everyone. Um, I would argue that that may still reflect a lot of inequalities in terms of student outcomes because the distribution of needs is not equal. And so uh, a compensatory model or a progressive model might take those federally subsidized, uh, that, those sort of federally concentrated funds and then distribute in a, in a way that, uh, or redistribute rather, in a way that um, students with higher need get more. That, that would be what I would advocate for uh, whether that receives much policy traction is <laughs> a whole other story. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, I think about this all the time. And, and actually, um, uh, I have a friend from Germany who just thinks that our entire school system is insane. Uh, whenever I talk to him about this work, he's just like, why would you do this? Um, you know, if anything, you would want the students um, inheriting the most disadvantaged to have access to even better schools. And you certainly wouldn't want to tie it to real estate and family backgrounds. When I talk to my friends from New Zealand, well, well, I'm from New Zealand. When I talk to the folks from back there, yeah, everyone just shakes their head. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I see a question from Al next. 
Actually, mine was very similar to what Shane asked. Um, so just drilling down a little bit further here, um, what, what percent of the, of the support of school districts, you know, I realize this varies widely across the states, but what, what percentage of them comes from purely local school taxes and, and from state assistance? Like in New York State, we have a mix here. It's low performing school districts get extra money. Uh, from the state, but I, I don't know, you know, have that, has that come into this at all and affect the results if you looked at that? It's basically similar to what Shane just asked you. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, so I don't, I, don't have, um, I don't have data to present on that. Um, we have looked at per pupil spending and we do have at the district level we can collect information about the proportion of expenditures uh, that come from the state, the federal, or from local property taxes. And so we can build that in um, to the model uh, and think through this a little bit. I did do some sort of per pupil spending. Um, like if we shift away from test score achievement and just use per pupil spending, um, what's interesting is actually the, the gaps, the black white gaps are not very strong based on what's available in the in the public data. And this gets back to this other uh, this other idea, which is that um, uh, if funding is perfectly equal, but the population's starting positions are fundamentally unequal, then we'll sort of see a persistence of that inequality. So, so what we've seen in the finance reform movement is that either states um, are offsetting differences in property taxes um, in different neighborhoods uh, by sort of centralizing, um, but also the federal government has Title I funding um, where it distributes to, to um, predominantly poor schools, it'll distribute extra funds. And then it, um, it, it attaches policy requirements to that, like um, you know, uh, districts can't be enforcing segregation or something if they wanna get their Title I funds. Um, and so, so, but your question, your question in Chains has me thinking that um, an, an obvious direction to take with this is to build in the property tax part of the story here and think about um, how much that's generating inequality and then how much as another policy option would be to sort of try to offset this. You could imagine, in fact, um, coming up with some kind of a formula that inverts the, uh, the neighborhood access to school quality metric that we've put on. Uh, it sort of inverts that and uses that as a funding formula, uh, a progressive funding formula. Oh, I'm I'm sorry. You're you're muted there. I said politically that would be difficult. Uh, <laughs> so a, a particular case that, that might be interesting is that I believe that if there's an army base or a, a military base in an area, they get supplemental funding of some sort, and that might give you an interesting case to see what that does to local districts that have heavy, uh, you know, military base increments. I, I don't know a lot about that. I just know that it exists, um, but it seems like it might be interesting. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I will say there's this other component, and this varies by state as well, but there are um, there are local bond issues that emerge. Um, uh, so in California, for instance, um, Piedmont has voted to infuse a, an additional uh, $9 million into their school system by raising local taxes sort of separate from property taxes. And, um, and I find this to be a really fascinating phenomenon because uh, in one sense, this is a, an inequality producing um, thing that they're doing <laughs> because they have the resources um, to do that. So I'm just actually gonna uh, show you from their website here. I was pulling it up while I was talking. Um, so, Right, right at the outset for Piedmont, you can see, I mean, these, it's a world-class education system there, and um, residents demonstrate their commitment to education in a variety of ways, but most importantly, through a parcel tax contributing approximately $9 million, um, nearly one-third of the district budget uh, yearly. And um, so that's one way that resources get infused. Um, it's a pretty small city, too, so that's, it's not a small tax. And, um, uh, 
and and so there but it's interesting that they frame it as a commitment to education um but it's for the kids in their community not a commitment to education more broadly and so if you what would be even more unpopular in my um uh, armchair uh <laughs> top-down uh, policy making would be to take any form of informal funding and equalize that as well. Um, I'm, I'm certainly not proposing that we do that, but, but we may need to think carefully about the ways uh, communities will always respond uh, to try to maintain an advantage. Now, re related to that, there's a question of what is the cost uh, per household relative to their uh, per household income of their of their, what they're paying for school taxes because there be obviously a Piedmont as you mentioned is high income area so if, you know adding on that whatever it was million you mentioned the, the per per household is just probably a small percentage of their total income when you go to an area where the people are you know working two jobs and you know kind of area where they're you know working at, at Walmart or something like that very low wages um, it, anything like that would be, might be a huge hit percentage wise on their family income. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I really appreciate that suggestion. Um, I've thought about that in sort of residential selection models, like how much uh, people are willing to move into these kinds of high opportunity neighborhoods vis-a-vis uh, -vis this cost relative to their own income. And so I, I think that that would be uh, really helpful. And the other thing, um, you know, I'm using the Bay Area here, which is uh, sort of an outlier housing market in the current current state. Um, uh, you know, and a question is, what's the elasticity between this sort of housing costs, like how much a dollar or a proportion of your income buys you in terms of access to school quality, um, probably varies really very widely across different markets. I think in Ithaca, compared to the Bay Area, uh, it's much favor much favor more favorable to Ithaca. And so um, uh, that's another sort of way that we want to think about this is um, constructing a, um, a way to view this, um, or, or sort of seeing how well heterogeneity across markets then might predict other sort of market level phenomenon in terms of um, economic mobility. It seems like you pretty much have the data or you can get it very easily for that and, and do the do the math on that and come up with a graph on that as well, you know, a, a map like this. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Well I I see we're uh I don't see any more questions and I know we're also just about out of time. Um so I yeah this has been really fun even though in the Zoom session it's always hard to get a sense of uh of how how the talk's going. I, I much prefer to give them in person, but um I really appreciate these attentive questions. And, um, you know, again, a lot of the behind the scenes work that made this possible is um, uh, Christian, who not only did the computational stuff, but has really worked through the models with me. And uh, we're both like uh, thinking about conditional logits um, like 20 hours a day, I think. And so, uh, uh, which is really fun to read the transportation literature where a lot of that comes from as well. So. Um, uh, I want to thank Christian again. He's been uh, outstanding on this, and, and we're excited as we continue to make progress. Thanks for your comments. Thank you very much. This is really excellent. Very interesting, yes. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm happy to stick around if anybody wanted to talk a little more, too. Well, since the, my mic is still open here, i Another interesting case would be that New York City has has had magnet schools for forever. So I don't know what that means forever, but before I was born, which is a long time ago, um, where uh, they were particularly tech schools and uh, some others as well that you could attend. I had relatives and I know I had lots of graduate students or undergraduates too who had been to some of those schools um, in uh, in, the, in New York City that you could just do a competitive test to get into them. And I, I'm not sure how that relates to what you're saying, but I have a feeling it does somehow as a, a case of what happens, um, what, what opportunities they do. I don't know, I have no idea whether segregation, you know, the color of your skin meant anything in 19, 
let's just say out of the blue here, 1950 or something like that, to getting into Brooklyn Tech, or there are a whole bunch of them in New York City. Mm -hmm. and some of them were for art and some of them were for technology. Um, but that would be interesting to go back and look at that. And I think, I imagine by now, it's not, it's not a factor in your admission. I, I would hope so, at least. And uh, it might be another interesting small, smaller study somebody might look into, maybe a master's study or something. Yeah, uh, I've been thinking about these sort of uh, academies that have entry requirements. So um, there are the, the big three in New York City, and then um, Boston has Bo Boston Latin, I think, is, uh, is the big one there. And it would be really helpful to catalog where there are entry requirements for these magnet schools, and then actually um, consider adding an additional friction component on to those. Um, the, the friction component is, is this interesting little feature that we have where um, because we observe students in a system that ostensibly allows inter-district transfer, but it still makes it pretty hard to do, um, the, a coefficient in our model will kind of tell us that it's not very likely that they're going to go, but there's still a remote possibility for the average kid in a block. But uh, to add this next layer of um, like a achievement requirement, uh, mm -hmm. We'd probably only be able to do that at the student level uh, with student level data um, rather than this sort of national block study. But I think yeah. it's important. Well, the New York City, for example, has the subway, which costs the same no matter how distant you're going. So if you're willing to sit on the subway for a longer time, it's, it's, it's sort of, uh, and, and you can study or whatever you can do on it. Uh, you know, it's, uh, and I used to travel around New York. I grew up in New York City. I used to travel around New York City. Um, school wise, I didn't do that, but I did it for things on the weekend. I would go to a, a museum on the other side of the city by, by, for some kind of a little class. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and just get on, I went on the subway for an hour sometimes. And I just did it every Saturday and it was fine, you know. I, I mean, it, the friction there was not economic at all. It was just a matter of whether, whether at my age I was willing to put that time in. And, mm -hmm. um, yeah, so uh, one, of the th one of the things we might do with open source route mapping data, we get road network and then we basically can predict uh, commute, co commute time across different mediums, but we don't have public transportation built in. We don't have any kind of school busing situation built in. You know, like Ithaca has school busing, uh, which would make a huge difference for people if they can, it might be the parents who don't wanna incur the cost. Like if they're willing to just put their kid on the bus, then and that's something different. Um, so one approach that we might do is apply for an NSF grant or something really big that will allow us to draw from Google's data, which really has a good accurate estimation of commute time. At, and we can specify the, the time of day and the mode, including public transit for, you know, we could probably do that for a handful of big cities to try to really wrap our, wrap our, our hands around this. The trouble is, um, Google's data are proprietary and extremely expensive for yep. the, the scale of calculation we want to do. But uh, very, but very I, expensive. <laughs> can, can I ask you? I know this is. I lived in Brooklyn for uh, for six years while I was uh, getting my PhD. PhD. Um, where did you live in Brooklyn, and where did you go to school? Are you asking me? Yeah. Oh, I I actually lived in the Bronx, and I used to go to Brooklyn on, on the subway to go to places at Brooklyn Museum. And I, I don't remember exactly what, and I would r routinely go swimming in Manhattan at the YMCA when I was, yeah. I don't know, probably 13 or 14. I don't, I don't remember exactly the de details, but you know, if you had the time, you get on the subway, it cost in those days very little money, even compared to income and you just did it. You know, it was just like, yeah, if I can afford to go to the subway three stops, I can afford to go to the other side of the city. That made a big difference. I mean, time was not, you know, I would be re reading a book or something. <laughs> I, yeah. I was a big reader. So that to me, getting on the subway and reading, you know, okay, just the only thing you had to watch out for is that you don't miss your stop if you got too engrossed in the book. And then you had to switch over to the other side of the platform and go back a couple of stops. Right, right. Hey, David, did you want to uh, contribute something? Because I saw you mentioned us in the Slack. Yeah, I just want to say that the, the New York City's specialized schools have come under quite a bit of visibility recently. 
um, exactly in this dimension. And I put a link in the chat, which sort of gives some of the sense of what the data looks like for the New York City specialized schools at the moment. Um, I mean, it's actually, I mean, in some sense, the, the, the last plot, which talks about students and percentage of students in poverty gives one indication. Um, but it's also there, I mean, I, I couldn't get my hands on it instantaneously. If you look at the geographic diversity and what neighborhoods are being drawn from, there mm -hmm. also is a fair amount of public data that really sort of says there's a long way to go in terms of um, leveling the playing field. Yeah, thank you for that. Well, this has been really fun. I, I so appreciate the opportunity to give the give a talk uh, on this new Christian. I've been running to get this all all put together. So uh, uh, I think, unless there are other questions, I think now is a good time for me to to end it for everybody. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you.